the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, the fact of fulfilled prophecy is a unique feature of Christianity. The coming of Jesus Christ was prophesied in the minute detail regarding his lineage, nature, place of birth, where he would be raised, his career, purpose, the specific manner and nature of his death, his resurrection, and many other other fulfilled prophecies. And all of these prophecies were made hundreds of years before his birth or first advent. His birth was, of course, the most unique birth in all of human history. Through ancient mythology was filled with tales of demigods who were supposed to be the progeny of lustful unions between women and gods or demons, there was nothing even close to the narrative of the birth of Jesus Christ. Christ's birth stands alone in history. By the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, God Himself took up residency in a virgin's womb in embryonic form so that after a natural nine-month pregnancy, she gave birth to a son who was also God's son. He was the God-man Savior, not God and dwelt man. He was both true and genuine humanity and undiminished deity united in one person forever. No other birth was like this in fact or fiction. As a result of this unique birth, Christ was able to bypass the curse of sin and the curse of Jeconiah so that he was uniquely qualified as the sinless one to both go to the cross to die as the lamp of God and to reign on the throne of his father David as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation chapter 5. This is found as mentioned above in the divine natures of Christ. Two natures united in one person. The Bible makes the claim that Jesus Christ is both God and man. As God, He created all things. John 1.1, Colossians 1.16 As man, He was sinless and came as the sinless substitute to die for man's, mankind's sin. But the declaration of Scripture and the evidence of His life affirm that He was not half man and half God, but totally man and totally God united in one person. He is God's indescribable and unfathomable gift to the world. He is the most unique person of the universe. No other religious leader has ever seriously made such a claim, for no other could support it by their life. His life is unparalleled in beauty, scope, character, and effect. No one can spoke like Jesus Christ did the things he did or made the claims he made. I repeat, his life is unparalleled in beauty, scope, character, and effect. No one ever spoke like Jesus Christ did the things he did or made the claims he made. In view of Christ's mighty words and works, and the perfect and sinless person men found him to be. The claims he made cannot be dismissed. People cannot, in all honesty to the historical evidence, dismiss Christ's claims as those of a madman or reject him as a fraud. Modern skeptics try to attribute his miracles and claims to simply the character of his life, but they do this simply because of their prejudice against the light that is truth and against the miraculous, not because there is a lack of bona fide historical evidence. His death is also unique, not because he was crucified, but because it was prophesied in Psalm 22, long before death by crucifixion was known in Palestine. Second, it is unique because of the manner in which he died, displaying his sinless and holy character. And third,
because of the miracles surrounding his death, the darkness, the earthquake, and the opening of the graves. After seeing Christ on the cross and the event of that day, the Roman centurion who had seen hundreds die on a cross said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Other religious and philosophical leaders have come and gone, risen and fallen, but none have come back from the dead to carry on their work as did Jesus Christ. I repeat, Other religious and philosophical leaders have come and gone, risen and fallen, but none have, have come back from the dead to carry on their work as did Jesus Christ. This too is unique not only because Jesus Christ stands alone in this respect, but because of the Old Testament predictions and in the uncontrovertible evidence for the historical fact of the resurrection, the empty tomb, his post-resurrection appearances, and the transformed lives of his disciples, not to mention the continuation of Christianity in the face of the greatest adversity. The fact is men reject Jesus Christ, his birth, miracles and resurrection not because of a lack of evidence but number one because they have never really researched the evidence with an open mind or second do not want to submit to his authority and claims and third because they have a basic anti-supernatural philosophy a prejudice against the miraculous or both. What makes Christ present unique? The virgin birth of the Son of God, the incarnation, the birth of the God-man. Only the virgin birth can give an adequate answer to the phenomena of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. In Christ's life and ministry, He demonstrated who He was, the God-man, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He also declared His purpose to die for our sin. In His death on the cross, Christ accomplished that purpose. He bore our sin in His sinless body on the tree. He died as our substitute and took our judgment. By His resurrection, God proved the value of His Son's death and the sinlessness of His person. It proves Him to be the unique God-man. It is necessary to grasp the meaning of three freedoms in the person of Christ. Really, there is a complete freedom. If we are going to be able to explain the full significance of freedom, these three freedoms are divine freedom, created freedom, human freedom. Divine freedom is to be understood as the uncreated freedom of the one, sovereign and free God who is the creator and redeemer of the world. Divine freedom as uncreated freedom is non-contingent freedom. This means that this type of freedom possesses the absolute freedom to exist. It depends on nothing outside of itself for its existence. Two, created freedom on the other hand is a contingent freedom Created freedom has boundaries that differentiate it from God's type of existence. We say that God is the eternal reality, but that the world is not. As God's creation, the world possesses a created freedom that is different from God's uncreated freedom. The world's created freedom may reflect in some ways the divine freedom, but the one cannot be confused with the other. The divine, uncreated, non-contingent reality of 
the transcendent and sovereign nature and being of God can never be thought to be the same as the material, created, temporal, and contingent things of the earth. Human freedom can be understood only as it existed as as it exists within the created freedom of the world. It's a unique way. Human freedom is allowed to echo divine freedom. A child of the Lord Jesus Christ, no integration of divine, created and human freedom is possible. A child of Him, we remain alienated and fragmented in our understanding of how God has actually accomplished the integration of these three freedoms. We turn the apparent freedom we enjoy into an idol when we are unable to integrate into our thinking the transcendence and the immanence inherent in these freedoms. There is a Christological center, if you like, to the secret of the rationality and intelligibility of human freedom. It is the subject of this center that I now wish to address. The history of human thought and human freedom have experienced real transformation as we have brought our minds into a creative relationship with the actual nature of the world we live in. These transformations only affirm the truth we find in the gospel. They are, I believe, a good indication of what it, it is meant by our freedom as our civilization has developed under the providence and prophecy of God's Word. The ancient recognized that understanding Christ meant resolving in some way the problem of the divine and human nature of Jesus. Thus the person of Jesus Christ is bound up with the resolution of the ancient philosophical problem of the whole and the part. Philoponos argued that in the case of the person of Jesus Christ, the impossible had occurred and we had to face this fact or deny God his divine freedom. The person of Jesus Christ was neither brute fact nor some pious phantom. The wholeness of the person of Jesus Christ is at once bound up with the wholeness of the life of God himself and the humanity of the world become fish. When he assumed his place in the virgin, a new reality unknown in the cosmos prior to Jesus' birth entered the world. And here we have the key to understanding the different types of freedom. Creative freedom thus wills to make mankind in the image of God. A profound restora restoration of all that mankind has lost it is disobedience to the word of God. With a divine freedom that only be possesses God has gone out of himself and become something or someone he had never been before, while at the same time remaining who he truly is. With this un uncreated and divine freedom, he has acted to make himself known as a man to all mankind. He has entered into his creation as a creature with, within his creation. He spoke the word of God, whose truth would free men and women from their covenant with death, sin, and evil, and prepare them for the new creation. In this way, the Creator as our Redeemer has indicated the way we must learn to think about the interaction between the divine and the human and the, cre and the created reality of its universe. In the Incarnation, the divine freedom of God's Word creates its own space-time. For the flesh he assumes, only the divine word that God the Son is, can define the particular man Christ exists as in the nature of God's creation. The world establishes its own reality within the space-time structures of the world. This is a divinely free act that creates what is utterly new in the history of the world. Here we understand the importance of imageless knowing in theology. God in His eternity has made Himself present with and for us in His creation that is on earth. In this way, human freedom from within the free creation has been given real union and communion with the, the Lord, God's very own divine freedom. 
It is important to understand that the Word did not leave some place in order to become this particular man, Jesus. It is also important to understand that human time has here been given real touch with God's eternity. All that we mean by divine freedom and all that we mean by human freedom is bound up together in the 